Um, so anyway, this is a anywhere or animals under welfare regime is our research project. We have some representatives of our project project here as well. Um, so it, even though it's called animals under a welfareist regime, it's not like that we necessarily condone welfareism, but we'd want to investigate welfareism. We want to develop a legal theory of what welfareism means in, in, in legal contexts. I also, also mentioned we have an academic visitor program as well. So feel free to come anytime, but not in January or February, or, because that's, that's, right. when you're, <laughs> that's when you're coming to Cambridge. <laughs> I should also mention this is something that might interest some of you that I've been involved in developing this and not this Birgit Wahlberg from Obo Academy was the sort of main main person who got started who got this started but there's like a open university online course thing going on uh, at the Obo Academy University I'm one of the teachers there so we've got over over 40 ECTS credits worth of online courses in animal law open to anyone just in case someone might be interested. Animal law theory is starting next week, I think. <clears throat> as far as I know, it's the first course entitled Animal Law Theory in the world, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so anyway, um, some of you might know my earlier work and, and w w one, one of the things that I've been trying to do has been to disprove the so-called, what I have come to call the orthodox inventory, and I'll soon explain what, what that is. So, but it is in a way, to some extent, a, a negative message, but now I'm, I'm trying to do a sort of a more positive thing. Um, so the so, so ne negative message has been, for instance, that I think animals already hold rights, legal rights, but they're still not legal persons. So there, there have been sort of a rephrasing or re-understanding of reconceptualization of legal personhood, for instance. Um, but now in sort of line with the objectives of the Anywhere project, uh, I'm more trying to achieve an overarching account of animal status in the law in the sort of positive sense. <clears throat> so this is what I've come to call the orthodox inventory of the universe. So this is very sort of black and white idea of what there is in the world according to the law. So and according to this traditional idea, there's persons in the middle and then there's things outside of persons and that's it. There's nothing, nothing else apart from that. So there are natural and artificial persons and then there are things. Not persons have rights, things don't have any, any rights. <clears throat> uh, and by the way, persons are not included among things. I, I don't mean that. It's just that persons are in the middle and things surround them because persons are more important than things. <clears throat> and this, these are some of the features that I think the, orth the, the this traditional way of understanding the inventory of the universe has. Um, I wonder if the text is too small, but I hope you can see it. <clears throat> so first of all, it's a formal, formal classification. So whether you're a person or a thing, it's based purely on formal criteria, whether, namely whether you hold at least one right or, or if you have the capacity for rights, then you're a person immediately. Um, then there's mutual exclusivity, meaning that you can be both a le legal person and a legal thing by definition. Um, it's the highest classification employed by the law, summa divisio, and it's thereby exhaustive and all-encompassing. So all entities are covered by this classification. Every entity is either a person or a thing. There is no third category, which sort of follows from three. And, and it's, uh, <clears throat> this is what I've come to realize more recently is that it's, it's often understood in a very totalizing manner. What I mean by totalizing manner is that it's often taken in the animal case. So if you say that animals are legally things, this is taken to sort of tell, say the, tell the whole truth about the legal status of animals. So you encounter these sentences when you read textbooks that legally animals are things, as if that would be sort of a, that will tell the whole truth about what animals are in, in the eyes of the law. So, so this is some of the, <laughs> I, I basically agree with all of this. <laughs> um, and this is, I've been trying to develop my graphic designer skills to <laughs> gradually to draw what I think, how, how, the, how it really looks like, or how it should look like, but the colors are not really represented properly there, unfortunately. It looks, looks better on my screen. <laughs> uh, but the idea is that you have persons with uh, sort of fuzzy boundaries, you have property here with fuzzy boundaries. Some entities can be both persons and property to some extent. Uh, but if there are also entities that are neither, some entities are neither persons nor property. 
Um, <clears throat> so when I've then been trying to develop this sort of a overarching account of, of how what, what the legal status of animals is, if it's not just that they're things, so what, what is it exactly? I, I made it complicated as, as I tend to do. So I've uh, come up with uh, six different distinctive features of animals that I think are re reflected in the law in different ways. <clears throat> so first of all, so, so you can think of this in terms of uh, how animals are different from say chairs or some other very prototypical things. So first of all, animals can produce food and other goods with their bodies. Um, and that's why we sometimes worry for their health because we want to make sure that they keep on producing these goods. Um, animals are biological and quite closely related to us, which means that there, there, are, uh, there are risks of animal diseases, risk of zoonoses. There are other health risks associated with animals that are not there when we're talking about chairs. But animals are also a source of scientific information. We can conduct animal experiment, experiments on animals. Um, animals are autonomous in a very broad sense of autonomy, mean, meaning that animals can do stuff on their own. You know, uh, animals can cause damage, but they can also use animal labor in various ways. Um, then we have, uh, so these are like very anthropocentric perspectives on animals. Then I, I have two perspectives that are, I think are anthropocentric, but maybe not as quite anthropocentric. And what, one is that an, animals can form connections with human beings and they can be, we can understand them as our companions and as part of our communities and family members and so on. Um, but, and, and they're also increasingly understood to be an important part of the ecosystem. So the an, animals, um, we, we protect some animals for, for the reason that they somehow contribute supposedly to biodiversity, for instance. And then finally, um, I think the clearest non-anthropocentric perspective on animals is animal as a sentient being. So being capable of experiencing welfare, suffering, pain, and, 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 and so on, uh, and that's protected for its own sake. Um, so these are, of course, just features of animals. But the, the, the question then is that how is these features of animals reflected in the law? <clears throat> and here I've tried to understand this in terms of three layers of law, three sort of. Uh, so we have like a what a three uh, historical developments that sort of don't override each other, but rather build upon each other. So first we have something that I call traditional legal thinghood. So, so here we have uh, animals more or less treated as any other animal. And here it's most of these anthropocentric perspectives that are, that are, that are relevant. Um, so animals are um, uh, things that we buy and sell, but uh, we have to worry a little bit about things like what if an animal causes damage to property, who is responsible in those cases and, and so on. We have to worry about uh, uh, what if I sell an animal and it gets sick or, or it is, was already sick? Who has to cover the damages? So this is an example of the biological nature of, of animals, for instance. Um, then more recently, we've had something that I call the modern exploitation regime, which is really just uh, a, a sort of a turbo version of, of, of traditional legal thinghood. So it's mostly this thing features of animals are still relevant. We still use them for production. They still worry for their health reasons, but it just gets a bit more intense. You know, we have uh, factory farming, we have antibi antibiotics and so on. So the old issues get, get um, um, just, well, how should I put it? Like it, it's, it's just get more, more um, intensive in various ways. I think the only sort of a, qualitatively different feature of the modern exploitation regime has to do with animal testing because that's a new way of exploiting the biological nature of animals. So we, earlier the biological nature of animals was mainly a sort of a, the fact that they could spread diseases and so on but nowadays we also ever since the advent of the modern exploitation regime we are also interested in, in, in testing stuff that, that would yield beneficial scientific conclusions for us. So, but this is still very anthropocentric. And then we have something 
that I call contemporary more than thinghood. And this is where it gets a bit interesting because um, first of all, it would seem that some animals are um, not merely things, there are special kinds of things, or in some cases, I, I would say certain animals are not things at all anymore. Some animals are not property. Um, I'll get back to that in a second. But here is a <laughs> bit of a complicated, uh, perhaps, <laughs> uh, d diagram or graph or whatever of how I think like these different features of animals are, are reflected in different areas of the law. So for instance, maybe I won't go through all of this here, but oh, by the way, I should just, it should be just visible. So, um, so for instance, if we think of traditional, um, by let's say the, the fact that animals are autonomous. Um, so this is uh, reflected in law governing damages caused by animals, for instance. And this, is an, uh, this has been around for millennia. We've had tort law rules for dealing with this kind of stuff. So um, this is not like a new development. So it's traditional legal thinghood. On the other hand, animal testing law is a relatively recent thing. It's a part of the modern exploitation regime. And here I think it's also part of contemporary more than thinghood because animal testing law also contains animal protection elements. Um, so there you have a combination of the fact that animals biologically resemble us, but also the fact that animals are sentient beings that are protected for their own sake, for instance. Um, hunting law similarly sort of uh, embodies various or reflects various um, um, distinctive features of animals. And um, so on. Um, but yeah, I'm going to say a bit more about like some of these new things that are going on. So that fall under under category three now. So <clears throat> what I then wa want to say about the thinghood of animals and what I claim to be the sort of contemporary more than thinghood uh, category. So. So. Um, so there are, I think, a number of problems with saying that animals would be, that animals are things and that's it. So first of all, even under the traditional idea, thinghood has only been one aspect of animals' legal status. It's not the whole truth. Second of all, thinghood is changing, and third of all, some animals are not things at all. I would, I will argue. So first of all. Um, <clears throat> Thinghood is only one aspect of animal law in the sense that, or, or the legal status of animals, in that it's a private law status. Thinghood is primarily private law. So if you look at uh, these legislation of civil law countries, where do you find these definitions of personhood and thinghood? It's in civil codes. It's a private law issue. Um, also with these traditional great theorists of, of thinghood and, and, and personhood like Savigny, you know, he was writing about private law. <clears throat> Um, but it's not obvious that animals are things under animal welfare law, for instance. I mean, it's sort of a it interplay. It's an interplay with the things, thinghood status of animals, but it's still uh, something, something distinct from that. Though I should, of course, uh, concede that uh, these other areas of law are sort of, a, in a way, parasitic on the private law status of animals. What I mean by that is that if you steal someone else's animal, we, and the fact that the animal is belongs to someone else is a private law thing. But if I steal it, it's theft. So criminal law, in a way, builds upon private law concepts. So it's not like these areas of law aren't interrelated. Um, another thing that I find problematic with saying that animals are things and that's it is that, well, first of all, even traditionally, animals have been special kinds of things. Well, that's not yet problematic, but you know that there have been special features of, of property law that have only applied to animals, like when animals cause harm. <clears throat> Second thing is that um, uh, there are like new aspects of thinghood that have been emerging recently. So for instance, the non-fungible value of animals has been rep recognized in, in various jurisdictions. What I mean by non-fungible value is that you can't just replace one pet with or one companion animal with another. You, um, so there are court cases, for instance, that if you harm someone else's dog, um, um, you're going to have to pay the veterinary costs, even if it exceeds the market value of the animal, for instance. So that's an example of, of how animals increasingly have this non-fungible value. 
to the organs. I don't think it's any kind of intrinsic value in the sense of ultimate value. It's just non-fungible value, like sentimental value. And in this sense, companion as animals might be described as irreplaceable things. Um, and, and there are very other, other aspects, like you know how animals' position in prior, uh, family law is changing in various countries, for instance. That's another way how their thinghood is changing. It's a new kind of thinghood. But then I think one thing that's very interesting is that uh, um, I don't think all animals are things anymore. <clears throat> so, um, so there are some wild animals, especially that are. Um, it's not obvious to me that in what way they would be things, because in sense of property. Because first of all, uh, if we think of environmental protection acts or like the European Habitats Directive that was discussed yesterday at the. PhD workshop. So first of all, some animals receive very strong protections from, from say, the Habitats Directive. But furthermore, um, what people maybe haven't been that interested in is that those acts uh, often preclude ownership of these animals. Yeah. And also, like the, for instance, the Finnish Animal Welfare Act uh, prohibits taking animals into your wild animals into your possession, for instance. So there's no obvious way in which you could, because the traditional doctrine in, in civil law countries especially has been the so-called res nullius doctrine, which is that um, animals are things <laughs> that are not owned by anyone, but that could be owned if someone were to take them into their possession. But there's no obvious way in, in which you can do that. You, you can't take a live animal into your possession. You can't sort of uh, claim dominion over them. You're not allowed to kill them. Even if you were to kill them, you're, especially in the case of these protected animals, you're not allowed to take the body into your possession. You, um, you're probably supposed to just leave it there or maybe donate it to the state or something if, if it has scientific value. So there's, I don't think if, if you think of ownership in terms of uh, this cluster of rights idea, the incidents of ownership, I, I'm not sure like any of those incidents potentially apply to, to these animals. <clears throat> but this depends on the jurisdiction. I realized this, especially after I last talked about this at our Helsinki conference in June that um, um, it seems that in some common law countries you have a doctrine that anim wild animals are owned by the state. Uh, I'm not sure if that makes any sense in practice, but I, I believe that <laughs> if that's, that's what the common lawyers tell me, then maybe that's how it works. I'm not convinced that it's real ownership, but maybe, maybe it is. Um, so, so to conclude, two minutes in advance, um, uh, the private law status of animals as things is, is but one aspect of their legal situation. And, and, and the truth is more complicated. Some animals are not things at all. Others have a special kind of status as, as things. Um, other, and, and in general, all animals have a, have a sort of particular features of, the, of, of property status that they're not reflected in, in, let's say, the legal status of chairs. And, and so I, I, even though it's still important to think of animals to, to concede that animals are still things. I think even in countries that have explicitly said that animals are not things, even in those countries, I think they are things <laughs> because those are just declarations. But thinghood is not like the whole truth about the legal status of animals. But thanks. Thank you.